This is fortification in the 70s. Top security, a NATO base, answerable only to Supreme Allied Commander Europe. Stations like this are capable of massive retaliatory strikes, massive and horrifying like modern warfare. Five, six, While the peace of the world is uneasy, the RAF has a sharp end. This is it. The hot line goes no farther than this. What's 2001 doing on Nordhorn? What are they dropping? They're dropping 28 pounders, sir. Two to blow one to four airborne at 15. The French-built Jaguar is the RAF's principal ground attack aircraft of the late 1970s. This is not the heavy nuclear strategic bomber, nor the high-altitude reconnaissance plane, nor the missile-carrying interceptor. These are other weapons in NATO's extensive armory. The Jaguar's role is to destroy local ground targets with devastating swiftness and accuracy. It carries a heavier payload of weapons than its forerunner, the Phantom, and it carries them further. It can destroy a target with pinpoint accuracy. For the navigator is a computer, which guides the pilot there and is also the brain behind the plane's weapon aiming system. The Jaguar is designed to fly fast and low out of sight of enemy ground radar. It's supersonic when required, but not for routine sorties. Fuel needs to be conserved. So, any day of the week, Jaguars of 14 Squadron can be seen over the Rhine at 500 feet and just below the speed of sound. These are the frontiers of freedom, and these planes are patrolling them. Finally, let's just go over the first run attack at Nordhorn again to make sure that uh, we're all exactly clear on what we're going to do. We'll be running in as a four ship in standard battle from the north, and I shall be turning at Dorpen onto a heading of about 190. At that point, I want you to take up a spacing, giving a minimum of 30 seconds, making sure that by the time we reach point alpha, that we have a spacing of at least three and a half miles. Turning onto 171, running down for a CCIP first run attack on the main strike target. Check that. Remember that the target area at Nordhorn has an inner circle that is uh, 30 feet across. So you want to be ground tracking just on the edge of that circle. Once you've dropped your bomb, call off hot or dry, and we'll clear and rejoin at Schutthof. OK, any questions? OK, fine, let's walk. We're going up to 28 at, and then we're coming back down through Nordhorn to finish off. In command of the squadron at 39 is Wing Commander Anthony Mumford. Uh, we'll have to try and get a Pembroke, I think, to go up and uh, take some wheels up. A couple of men, change it round. I think we'll get it done tonight. It's only a bit too late, I think, to get that done now. Yeah. We'll be planning on him tomorrow for anything special. No. Oh. That just leaves you to do it, basically. OK, anyway, you've got a, you're on the range, I presume, at the end of the slot? Yes, we are. Well, you've got to press on or you'll miss it. There you go. Ten minutes, sir. Men like these, capable of flying millions of pounds worth of sophisticated machinery at supersonic speeds, where are men like these found? How are they trained? How do they simply stand the pressure and yet stay so very human? If the Royal Air Force needs 200 Jaguar pilots, you'd think that with a population nearing 60 million, it wouldn't be too difficult. 
All the same, it's not everyone who's got five O levels. That's the first qualification. A lot of other qualities are needed as well, which is perhaps why nearly 10,000 young men every year make inquiries about careers as pilots or navigators, but only 2,000 ever reach Biggin Hill. That's where a long and comprehensive selection process starts. First of all, medical tests, aptitude tests, personal quality tests. From the 2,000 applicants, an average of one in eight will get through the net. From here on, it's constant selection and refinement. Octu at Henlow, onto the RAF College at Cranwell, then primary flying, basic flying training on Jet Provost 3s, then off to Linton on Ouse for advanced flying training on Jet Provost 5s, and then, for those still in the fast jet stream of trainees, onto a tactical weapons unit, onto an operational conversion unit, like Lossiemouth for Jaguars, and eventually to a squadron. At every one of these stages, a small percentage fails. Not dimness or lack of stamina or lack of physique, just unsuitability for very fast jets. So, 200 Jaguar pilots are not so easy to find after all. The squadron was the first squadron outside Britain to be equipped with Jaguars. The first months were spent working up to full operational capability. Range practice here in Germany, bombs of low explosive charge are enough to prove the accuracy of both pilot and flight. An arsenal of really serious weapons is available to every Jaguar squadron to be flown at a moment's notice. Whenever a pilot, however experienced, is posted for a tour of duty flying a new or unfamiliar plane, it's back to flying school again for a few months. The flying school for Jaguars, or Operational Conversion Unit as it's more properly called, is at Lossiemouth in northern Scotland. These four young pilots, nearing the end of their courses, have just heard of their posting to 17 Squadron Bruggen. Dave Weston, with a degree in economics, is already a flight lieutenant. Andy Stevens joined straight from school and is a flying officer, like Dave Needham, who left his Shrewsbury school with 10-0 and 4-A levels. 
Stuart Slater spent three years at Loughborough before joining up. For all of them, it's a successful end to three and a half years training. A moment to reflect with justifiable pride. Yes, to be honest, I'm fairly proud and slightly big-headed about having got this far. Because you see people dropping by the wayside all the way through training. You know, it happens at basic training. And if you get through that, you think you're fairly good. You probably think you're very good. And then when you get to advanced training, you suddenly realise that it's a bit more involved. And as people start dropping out all along the training, obviously your ego tends to inflate slightly by virtue of the fact that you're still there. Uh, but certainly going to Germany as well, as far as I'm concerned, another example of the fact that they're fairly happy that you're good enough to go to Germany on a new squadron, operating a new aircraft, in a theatre where it's not been operated yet. And obviously I'm fairly proud about that. I think it should be the dream of every fighter pilot to go to Germany, because it's where it's all happening, you know, front line, where you find out what flying's all about. As well as getting a change of scenery, very good, I'm very pleased about that. The most satisfaction so far was my first trip in a frontline airplane. To me, it was really great. It was the end of a long road. It's just the beginning of another one, I think, as well now, because we've got six months operational workup, which is going to be hard work. But it's something to look forward to. I decided when I was about 15 that I wanted to be a military pilot. I've been interested in aeroplanes since I was 10 or 11. I was keen to do a physical job of some sort or another, and it just built up from there. I knew very little about the forces when I joined. I didn't know anything about what being an officer involved. The best thing for me personally is the flying. That's the overriding thing that keeps me in the Air Force. It makes me want to be in it. It's superb. I've always wanted to fly since I was at school. I went to a school near Plymouth and I can remember sitting on the grass in the school playing fields, watching the planes flying overhead, there being an airfield nearby. And I can remember one day suddenly saying to myself, that's what I'm going to do. throttle on the runway and rolling down the runway at speed. The sensation of speed is really great. It's one of the most satisfying things about flying, the sensation of speed that you get. may seem lyrical, the aircraft glamorous and the pilots boyish. But flying at 250 feet and 420 knots is a man's job. It's deadly serious and requires every ounce of concentration a man has. When you're flying along, low level, in and out of the valleys, pulling G and rolling over hills, things like that. It's something you've actually got to see. And there's numerous times when I've been sat there thinking to myself, I wish I could take my brother and show him what it's all about. Because no matter how much you sit on the ground and talk and say it's like this, it's like that, you could never get the true feeling over. It's something you've got to experience, and I think everybody should experience it. Well, there's no real way of describing it to someone who's never experienced it. Zooming up to 25,000 feet, rolling over on your back and looking down at the whole of Wales and Ireland on a good day. It's fantastic, the feeling of freedom when you're up in the plane. I think the only way is to take them up and show them. It's impossible to describe, because it's not only the exhilaration of flying fast, low, but you're working all the time, and at this stage in the course, not far below your own limits, because they're pushing you all the time. The nearest I could describe it is to say, have you ever ridden on a bus, and then say, can you imagine what it would be like driving a Formula One racing car in a Grand Prix? It's that kind of comparison between flying an airliner and flying a single-seat ground attack aircraft at low level at this kind of speed. Uh, while you're flying, you're completely independent. You're working to your own levels, doing things to your own satisfaction. Once you're off the ground, then really everything is up to you. And if you like, your life is in your own hands, which appeals to me, I suppose. There is obviously an element of danger, which is nice to feel that it's there.
It's the only sort of pilot I'd like to be. Flying a high-performance aircraft, near to its limits, certainly to your limits on occasions, and the sheer exhilaration of it, something you'll never get from an airliner or any other kind of commercial aircraft that you could do for a living. And it's such a varied job within its bounds that it just doesn't have a comparison in civil life. I was lucky. I didn't know an awful lot about flying, but once I'd started, and now I'm into the career, I wouldn't be happy doing anything else. And here I am, getting paid for doing something that, in my opinion, is one of the nicest things in the world to do. It's concentration all the time. And there are a few points in the sortie when you can sit back and look around and think to yourself, well, here I am, flying a million and a half pound airplane around the sky. It's hard work, definitely, to start with, but I think you do appreciate it more when you're on the ground. Coming, coming, coming. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. That's all well. Can't complain about that at all. Mm -hmm. oh, so well, those, those buildings are probably... Um, no, it's fine up until the, uh, till the south of the area, then it gets a bit... A bit murky, but other than yeah. that, uh, it's good that we fly to come back up the east coast. Lighthouse is easy. Yeah, we'll do. Easy lighthouse. That uh, church place on the left coast. Where's Stu really gone to? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry about that. What's um, the claims then? Yeah. Kill, kill, kill. kill. Yeah. Second time round, I won, I'm afraid. Four kills. Yeah. West coast. Here on the squadron, the staff-student relationship is is really great. In fact, there's no distinction at all. We're just one bunch of people. Some are more experienced than others, and the more experienced ones are handing over their knowledge to less experienced ones. And the, I, sp I suppose you could call it the esprit de corps, because that's what it is here on the squadron, is, is really good. Four figures all the way down inside. Because <laughs> I didn't know which one was a heading when I figured that thing out. I had the faintest idea what was going on. Were you wearing your glasses? No. Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. okay, if you finish your coffees and have your debrief, I'll get the film, and when it comes in, we'll go across the sunny room and see okay. how true these claims are. These pilots are on the threshold of a career. As in any profession, how far up the ladder they go is a question of ambition and aptitude for command. But, unlike other professions, and even other branches of the RAF, strike attack pilots need a unique combination of gifts. High intelligence, lightning reflexes, and ice-cold nerve. These qualities are the qualities of youth. You have to be young to fly really fast jets. Flying a desk comes later. The sort of chap I'm after is the dedicated enthusiast. The chap whose sole ambition in life is to fly a Jaguar, and particularly in the ground attack role. And the sort of chap I'm after is the man like this, who has the presence of mind to stop a damn great seagull, smack in the windscreen in the order of 400 knots, and doesn't eject, brings that airplane back safely to me. We mix socially a lot, we have lots of parties, and you sort of tend to congregate together all of the time. Although there's, there's not a lot to do here at Lossiemouth, it's just what you make of it, I think. And we do make quite a lot of it. But even the gayest party is only a background to the serious business of the Royal Air Force. Tomorrow, these four are leaving for Germany. Meanwhile, their instructors discuss the eternally elusive, what makes a superlative RAF officer. When well, really, the sort of guys we want are, uh, are like uh, most of the courses, in fact, the guys who join to fly airplanes and fight with them. For the four young pilots, this is the predestined end of all their training. Bruggen, Germany. Frontline, the sharp end. These men are literally packing for their lives. And we want the guy that's rearing to go, kick the tires and light the fires, and last airborne's number four. I think one of the influencing factors that decided me to join the Air Force was I'm among these strange creatures, possibly, there's a, a patriot. I believe very much in the way of life that I have and the sort of freedom that I enjoy. And I think it's worth looking after and, and, and it's worth fighting for in the end if necessary. So that's one of the reasons I joined 
And I like to think that people who joined at the same time and even joining now have the same ideals. And I think it's so long since we've had the necessity to physically defend ourselves in a war environment and the nation is getting away from the true reason for having a service, which is your very reason. That's why possibly it comes back now to the fact, as you said, it's so long since we were involved in any conflict that a lot of young people today don't realise exactly what could happen or what might happen because maybe their parents are too young to remember the experiences of the last war. For the instructors, another course, another batch of new faces. Pupils to turn into teachers, officer material to turn into officers, pilots to turn into warriors. Warriors, the first tow into the cold, cold water. Standbys, alerts, exercises, shutdowns, standbys, more alerts and more exercises. No respect for time or leave or leisure or persons. These men are leaving for the front line, the frontiers, as we think the frontiers of freedom. Our freedom is in their hands, hence the endless exercises. As near real as you'll ever see. If the unthinkable ever happens in Europe, it'll look something like this. If you want peace on this earth, you've got to prove to any potential enemy that you're prepared and you are capable, and that's important, but capable of destroying him and killing him. And that's what we aim at, and that's why we work day in, day out, hard to try and improve our efficiency so that we can do that. 